morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending upon where you are in the world, and welcome to today's webinar. Magnetic component design considerations for SMPS applications using silicon carbide and gallium nitride technology. Brought to you by Tech Online, Borns, Arrow, and broadcast by Aspen Core. I'm Chris Keech, and I'll be your moderator today. We have just a few brief announcements before we begin. First, the slides will advance automatically throughout the event. You may also download a copy of the slides by clicking on the green folder icon located at the bottom of your screen. You can participate in our Q&A session by asking questions at any time during this webinar. Just type your question into the Q&A text area located to the right of the presentation window and then click the submit button. Please note that we'll try to get to as many of your questions as we possibly can at the end of our program today. However, if we're unable to get to your individual question today, someone will get back to you after the program is over. Also at this time, we recommend that you disable your computer's pop-up blockers. And at the end of the webinar, we will ask you to complete our feedback form. Your feedback will provide us with valuable information on how we can improve future events. You can also launch the survey at any time by clicking on the red survey button at the bottom of your console. And if you're experiencing any technical problems, please type your issue into the Q&A text area, and we will be glad to offer one-on-one -on -one assistance. And now, on to the presentation. Magnetic component design considerations for SMPS applications using silicon carbide and gallium nitride technology. Discussing today's topic is Kyle Moldenhauer, Power Applications Engineer, Technical Marketing at Borns. Kyle holds a BSEE degree from South Dakota State University and a BA Mathematics degree from St. Olaf College. Kyle has over 20 years of magnetics experience covering design engineering, field applications, product applications, manufacturing, and product development. It's with great pleasure I now hand things over to Kyle to begin. Kyle, take it away. Thank you, Chris, and thank you everyone for joining uh, this webinar today. Um, like Chris said, uh, today we're going to be uh, delving a little bit into silicon and carbide and GAN, uh, FET switching from the perspective of magnetic component design. Um, to do that, a uh, little bit of an overview first of Borns, uh, our magnetics division here at Borns itself. Um, actually do a quick uh, overview of, of SICK and GAN. Uh, FET uh, properties, and then how do those fit into the magnetics design for, for the properties of the FETs themselves? Um, give you some examples of products and solutions that we have, some road mapping items uh, that we have as far as how we approach um, new releases uh, and NPIs uh, at Horns, and then uh, introduce a, a review that we did with a new Wolf Speed Speed Valve kit. Um, seemed to be a pretty good design example, um, seeing kind of a uh, optimized inductor and then there's such a range in the speed valve kit you can I try to show graphically uh, the comparisons uh, the dynamics of how the magnetics actually react um, in specific to changing of uh, frequency uh, in this case and then finish up with just a little bit of an overview for uh, EMI materials um, and using uh, different formulations of different you know ferrites uh, alloys and things on a broad spectrum range because um, uh, uh, lately with SIC and GAN descriptions, I've had um, more questions about EMI and how that's going to uh, affect the magnetics and how to mitigate noise. Uh, and then finish up with the summary. So to begin with Borns as a magnetics division, uh, we're divided into three different sectors. Um, it's kind of funny, we call it our power and signal magnetic components, meaning all of our you know, catalog and standard magnetics products that we have available either through our distributors or online. Uh, and then moving on to the actual custom magnetics division, which uh, I actually belong to, um, full custom design capabilities uh, in factories that I'll discuss in a couple of uh, slides, um, fully approved for automotive certification and building um, with design and product development, uh, China, Mexico, North America, Europe, um, uh, pretty much every geosphere uh, on the planet. And then lastly, um, describe a little bit uh, of a new acquisition that we had in 2021 of Kosh components, which expanded Born's vertical integration to being uh, able to have uh, access to 
different uh, grades of, uh, in particular, ferrite material um, using their material scientists so we can come up uh, with uh, new and evolving formulations for a ferrite that may not be uh, available from a regular market uh, share supplier. Um, again, touching on our automotive grade magnetics, uh, I realized uh, Sick and Gan FETS switching art, uh, you know, materialized the automotive only. Um, but I put this up here also in addition to uh, the large industrial grade um, projects that we get involved with are essentially becoming really through increased operating temperatures, more robust operation, um, essentially, you know, performing and measuring the same types of that we would do for automotive grade magnetics. And so uh, as a follow-up, uh, as you see in the next slide, our, our facility is fully IAT up certified uh, for, for magnetic production, uh, AECQ uh, 200 and, and other AECQ testing protocol capable with all the measurement systems. And then the PPAP uh, documentation for pre-production um, you know, requirements as needed from you, the customer. Um, so to support all of that, um, global infrastructure uh, from an R&D and, and building production perspective, um, if you start on the left-hand side of the slide, um, our two main facilities uh, in China, uh, one is in Dongguan, uh, it's just across the, uh, the bay from, from, from Hong Kong. That's our main custom transformer uh, facility that's doing our large-scale uh, integrated uh, automation and, and large-scale production um re requirements and, and capabilities um it houses it's our fully uh automotive certified facility um and does the bulk of our our larger scale higher power and then like i say um large volume type magnetics uh complement to that is our shaman facility uh in china they will concentrate more on essentially smaller transformers on our signal product lines, um, essentially small toroid windings, uh, small, small scale uh, core and bobbin, um, and smaller planar magnetics. Uh, and then Taiwan is our, our center of uh, excellence for our, our catalog products um, that we have. Uh, anything that you would see, you know, website fully available through distribution. Uh, and then our Chihuahua facility in Mexico is, is interesting. It's a new development, um, really with, you know, the climates for, for uh, COVID bringing about supply and demand issues and what's happening on, on a, a geopolitical uh, atmosphere these days. Um, the need to kind of start pulling integrated manufacturing back to North America. We're expanding our, our Chihuahua Mexico facility um, aggressively uh, over the next couple of years. Um, pulling things that are uh, essentially centered or what have been centered in our uh, China facility for building. Um, we're getting close to closer to uh, an after situation with Mexico uh, being able to have products more readily available more quickly for the public. Then the last two sites in Germany and Tunisia. Um, Germany is the home for Kosh components for acquisition. Uh, Germany is the main R&D facility for them. Uh, with their own production facilities uh, in Tunisia. So to support um, all the production um, capabilities that we have, um, the next two slides are really boiling down to our analysis capability uh, at a calculation and, and response to, to doing preliminary data sheets at Borns. Um, we have fully capable design engineering services uh, with full capability to analyze in greater detail uh, which from a magmatics perspective boils down to uh, accurate AC loss analysis in addition to DC loss analysis and those reactions through, you know, all the proper programs, including uh, Maxwell's ANSYS for FEA uh, analysis, um, SPICE programming and, and different capabilities uh, to fill in requests from you in pre-calculation and then being able to follow that up with uh, measurement capabilities. Uh, in this case, I wanted to highlight uh, uh, our Mad Mix power loss test system where we can actually take uh, real world input. Instead of a typical sine wave uh, output from calculation, we can actually put a square wave uh, into the component itself to essentially get accurate AC loss and then divide that up to DC loss from coil, AC loss from coil, uh, and then also total core loss at the same time in real world testing situations. 
So now moving on, um, really to second GAN properties for operation. Um, again, from the magnetics perspective, it really boils down to uh, the differentiation of, uh, you know, the operating voltage of silicon carbide being of higher voltage uh, in our perspective at uh, a frequency range switch that's actually quite interesting to us as far as the materials change goes. Um, you can see for traditional silicon, and these are not hard set ranges, but typically we see, you know, 5 to 50 kilohertz as far as a, a switching frequency goes for silicon versus silicon carbide, which, which moves us into a higher realm, uh, in particular towards this higher end uh, in an approaching really anything over 50 kilohertz, um, which as you'll see in, in a presentation, I'll say it again, is uh, really a definite change from more of a like a, a nickel or, or iron type of, of either tape wound core or alloy type of mix uh, designed for lowest core loss at lower frequency. Um, silicon carbide represents a change to being able to use more ferrite type materials for design, um, which are more you know optimized for core loss in, at a higher frequency. Um, and again, we'll explain that in, in greater depth in the next few slides. Um, as opposed to GAN, which in our realm is, is a little bit lower uh, input voltage uh, requirements that we've been seeing. And actually for a frequency range that is already from, from just a standard MOSFET frequency range into GAN, uh, being definitely, you know, ferrite and advanced alloy uh, type mixes, but now starting to be a challenge with the multi megahertz divisions um, finding, you know, a, a selection of materials to meet that requirement. Um, and this is where really, you know, advanced research into, you know, better materials at higher frequency in terms of core loss, um, which is, you know, emerging and, and is in a lot of different discussions that I have in particular about material. So how does that apply specifically to the magnetics? Um, really, it's on state performance at a higher voltage. So being able to handle that input voltage at a very high level, we were already doing that day in and day out, but it's becoming more prevalent uh, really with the adoption of SIC being more um, prevalent and really the kind of the decision tree as to whether we're using SICK or GAN type FETs doesn't necessarily affect the operating voltage, but again, the combination of moving to SICK at high voltage um, adds to that design mix uh, for the magnetics. And then the main thing, higher frequency switching and, and temperature operation for the magnetics themselves. That's really the core of the, the presentation today is in, in that one sentence is higher frequency and how does that affect the magnetics design um, while still maintaining you know safe, reliable, um, and you know, power volumetric operation uh, as small as possible with the lowest losses uh, in any given magnetic component. So the core of this, um, I try to say, it's like, what's what's the one slide I can show? You know, typically engineers. Um, so my first thought is, what equation can I show them? Um, and really, it's the the classic uh, magnetics equation for those of you who don't know, based on Faraday's law, which left hand side of the equation is B sub M. It's essentially operating the flux density of the, the core uh, size that you're using with the, and the material based on the right side, which is really the inputs for the parameters that you need. Um, the thing to point out is that flux density is uh, inversely proportional to frequency. And so as you increase frequency, um, operational flux density decreases from an input perspective. And then it's also, you can see A sub C, which is core area. So essentially it's the connotation that as I increase frequency, all things being equal, uh, I could decrease core area, keep my operating flux density about the same, which leads to this connotation that says, I can make the magnetics as small as I want if I just make the frequency higher, higher, higher. Well, that's right some of the time. <laughs> Uh, in fact, it's what we strive to do. Um, however, the next slides are other considerations besides a kind of an ideal equation perspective into something that's more of the real world. Um, and the first thing is uh, core material selection, which from a operating frequency standpoint is the decision tree um, for uh, the start of a selection. Um, so before that advanced 
of operating frequencies greater than about approximately 30 kilohertz, uh, you can start taking advantage of uh, ferrite-type materials uh, to produce lower score loss uh, for an SIC operational uh, circuit. However, for GAN, uh, operating frequencies then, as they get above, you know, five, 600 kilohertz, um, ferrite is already being used for those types of designs. Uh, as you get higher and higher in frequency, the amount of core loss increases typically for ferrite. And so it's still in the realm of using that material. However, uh, the selection of materials becomes fewer uh, at that higher frequency. So then the more creative aspect of what material should we use, um, it doesn't become more difficult. It's just the selection becomes, um, I would say on average again, just fewer materials out there to use um, for a true optimized design. Um, and uh, having said that, then from ferrite, we start looking at uh, higher frequency, you know, powder type materials, um, you know, carbonyl mixes and different types of alloys for lowest core loss. Um, other thing to consider then, um, since we're talking about transformers in an inductive uh, atmosphere, we need to talk about energy storage. Um, whether you're using a powder material, which already has, uh, really this is, I call this the gapping slide, which already has a distributed gap uh, into it because you're actually just smashing powder around a, a binder to hold a shape. Um, gapping physically in the real world uh, centers around ferrite material. And so this is actually a physical gap uh, in the magnetic path length that needs to be established in order to increase uh, its, really its DC current loading capabilities. Um, and I get the takeaway for this is really saturation current handling um, is, is, the, is the kind of market term that's used. So what happens when you gap something? Um, so you've got a material that starts out at initial permeability uh, and you want to gap it. Um, so by the equations on the left, as I increase the gap size, I'm actually decreasing from that uh, initial permeability to something it, at a lower incremental permeability. The advantage is uh, what's called a shearing of the BH loop or increasing its, its field strength handling really due to that gap itself to increase its current handling capability, but by decreasing the permeability of the material, you're actually lowering the amount of inductance per unit of turn of winding you put on the core. So then it becomes that balance between saying, uh, how much should we gap this in order to be able to handle the amount of saturation current that we need to handle, uh, at the same time keeping as much inductance per, two, per turn, because we want to minimize the number of turns per winding that we use to achieve that inductance. And so then it becomes this little dance between the two. Um, and then you have effective, uh, what's, what's called an effective permeability roll-off curve. And it's really what I'm showing in order to balance to say, where will this component operate at a given inductance at a maximum amount of current before it, the inductance starts to roll off uh, due to that you know, energy exhaustion in that volumetric core uh, situation. Um, and then the other thing is, you know, the, basically the gap is, is going to be only so large. And then the other thing to consider with it as a single gap, this is where multiple gap conversations come into play, is that uh, with larger gaps, you start worrying about, you know, EMI mitigation from the, the gap itself producing noise, because uh, it's really putting lost energy really into the windings and cells for conducted emission losses. And then uh, the, encom the encompassing thing for there is, is fringing flux. Um, in other words, what's escaping out of the, the core itself? Because uh, you're lowering the reluctance of this, this distance in, in the core itself. So you've got little fringing um, areas around the edge that can mitigate out into other windings, or, uh, and it basically just escapes. Um, all the flux uh, energy going from one point to the other is, is, is not held faithfully uh, in a gap. Uh, and as it gets larger, it gets worse. So moving on from material, uh, now we need to think about the actual coil itself, the, the wire. Um, so all the increasing frequency uh, talks about different materials that we can use is great. 
However, we're dealing with a, uh, a simply a, a power situation. And though increasing frequency may happen, the power level remains the same. So the circulating currents remain approximately the same. So we still need to maintain the still, or still need to maintain the gauge of uh, copper wire that's used uh, in the windings themselves. So even though frequency increases, current doesn't. So if you have to already use a big fat wire, it's how are we gonna make a big fat wire fit on something that's theoretically smaller or more optimized uh, for high frequency operation? Uh, so that becomes a discussion. It's like, how are you going to lay out the coil uh, with respect to the, the rest of the component uh, in order to realize a design, um, you know, an end product? Um, and this is where you have conversations with, you know, high frequency, you have, you know, AC losses in the windings, you want to use smaller, uh, multiple strands of wire, uh, perhaps, you know, plain hard comes up in discussions all the time, more centered around how are we going to uh, keep parasitics low, uh, flat wire conversations, all those types of things uh, come into the mix, uh, purely based on, on coil winding dynamics uh, that still need to be met simply because the same gauge of wire still needs to be used to be able to handle the amount of current in the circuit. And then the last thing, um, and this deals more really with isolated designs, is the pesky safety standards that we need to deal with um, that uh, affect the construction of the transformer, that even with higher frequency or optimized design, uh, the standards are still there. So creepage and clearance distances will still apply. Uh, and that's the, the item that I have here. So you've got, you know, clearance distance between air, creepage along the surface. Those distances don't change. And so you need still physical distance uh, from uh, the, you know, the internal surface of the, of the winding out to the termination pins. Um, and it's a little bit of a misnomer that I found from people that, um, well, there's annexes. I can use, you know, extruded wire to be able to, to meet this. Well, that's definitely true for the, the internal portion of the coil here, um, but it's still the distance between the core, which is a ungrounded uh, reference to the outside pin. That's where this physical distance still needs to be maintained in the construction of the transformer. So distance could equate to still, um, you know, not being able to, even though you could use a smaller core, um, there's still limitations with the bobbin and winding because of this distance that still needs to be met. So how does it relate to really road mapping that they do uh, or that we do at Borns um, with our products and solutions? Um, well, this is an AIO slide to just say it's, you know, always we're going to start with optimization of, of core loss because the first thing you're going to choose is a core size. Then from there to say, how much copper do we need to squish into this core size that we have developed? And how are we going to do it for most effective uh, AC loss reduction um, with assuming this higher frequency of operation? Um, and then say, okay, now it's got to be stick stable because um, we keep seeing increasing uh, operating temperature requests from our customers. And, oh, yeah, higher frequency. Now we got, you know, EMI considerations that we need to have better shielding for and oh yeah, at the end of the day, it needs to be smaller. So it's kind of that progression of things that we, we look at for road mapping. Uh, and graphically, it's really how do you balance the, the, the magnetic saturation current that the inductor needs to handle uh, as opposed to which it's really, it's temperature stability to really due to AC losses. Um, and so again, it becomes that balancing act to find something in between. And the result is really uh, something that that um, needs to be designed really from internal coil uh, conversations if we're working with molded components um, and winding surfaces as to the amount or the volumetric amount of material that we need to use. Um, and all those things really kind of culminate into a development strategy um, that for a given size of inductor release that we have at Borns, um, you know, years ago we could do run release that covered many, many different aspects of this optimization, whether it be temperature or, or saturation or some aspect. Um, well, now it's become so intrinsically um, difficult to meet one component to meet all those criteria that in, a, in the same size packages, 
you'll start to see multiple releases uh, of, of different um, series that, that take advantage of points of interest. Um, in this case now, we've got several sizes, you know, auto grade type uh, components versus high temperature. Um, we need something that's, you know, physically pricing more viable. So we got a consumer grade product uh, of that. Now we need something auto grade that needs to be uh, robust for vibration. The inductor still looked all the same size, but it's taking advantage of all these individual uh, type of aspects that we need to concentrate on simply because we can't really, we try to stuff as many as we can, but we can't put them all in one package uh, type release anymore. Um, now moving on to really some solutions here and, and really this more deals with uh, moving to the custom side of magnetics versus our uh, catalog release product uh, road mapping. Um, so this is an example of uh, a Koshka development um, that was an SIC uh, switching atmosphere um, that was between 50 and 100 kilohertz. Um, and so after just discussing <laughs> all the aspects that, that limit ourselves to optimize the magnetics, um, I'm gonna choose actually some really good poster children to show you how we can decrease size with increasing frequency. Um, so here's a comparison. It's a three-phase AC inductor uh, for PV inverter. Uh, it was a choke at 3.3 kilowatts. I need to bring up my pointer again. Um, so 3.3 uh, kilowatt metal alloy design at 16 kilohertz uh, with the resulting calculation, six watts of core loss, uh, 45 milliohms DCR. Um, and notice that it weighs uh, 2.8 kilograms, which is what, about five or so pounds um, um, in weight. And then uh, a more optimized design from a customer that says, okay, we want to switch to something that's in and around 100 kilohertz. So you'll notice same power level, uh, but with an optimized design, uh, switching from a metal alloy, and this happens to be a, a ferrite design, um, you're seeing reduced core loss, uh, much lower uh, reduction in DCR um, for higher permeability, uh, inductance per turn, that sl slide that I went through before, at a much lower and lower weight. And then the end product is seeing, uh, you know, a great reduction in size, um, not quite half, um, but much, much smaller from before. So yes, there are instances in particular with silicon carbide uh, that we can definitely uh, optimize the design and make the magnetics smaller, essentially. Um, moving on again to, to the meat of examples for our, the speed valve kit that I mentioned for Wolf Speed before. Um, this is an eval system that Wolf Speed is uh, in the process of releasing or has released already. Um, we were fortunate enough to be on the design uh, to be able to take advantage of the output filter stage. Um, and so working with wheel speed engineers to really optimize the inductor uh, for the total range of the project itself. Uh, you can see here the original design parameters here and uh, notice it's a 16 kilowatt output with a design operating uh, frequency of 80 kilohertz. Whereas on the right hand side of the uh, slide, you know, you've got a total V in and V out range, which is, is uh, this, approximately the same, uh, but the output power range, and then you'll notice here the frequency range of interest totally for the kit. So the challenge was, is how do we find the best uh, one inductor <laughs> to put into this filter in order to meet um, all the extrema of either end uh, of the operating parameters of the, of the project? And so we picked 80, 80 kilohertz as a, a design uh, frequency operation. Um, kind of limited, you know, peak current. Let me get my pointer on again. Actually, I'm going to go for red. And so you've got peak current uh, operating in the, you know, 40 to 45 amp range. Uh, and then say, okay, from a design parameter, um, where are we going to lie? And so calculated efforts here, uh, we came up with approximately 220 microhenries of operating inductance uh, to have a fairly well behaved output. Um, got nice continuous mode operation, uh, ripples kept in, in check. Um, and so we've got a, a pretty decent calculated design criteria. And then for there, again, it comes from a material selection. 
uh, for this one, for instance, um, uh, a silicon iron alloy, um, really, I believe it's a Kumu Max type material from Mag Inc uh, was chosen, uh, really in relation to its just total core loss over the entire frequency range of operation. Uh, so nominally, we're going to be in something that's, you know, in the, in the 80 kilohertz range, but we need to go something from here to, what was it, nearly two or 300 kilohertz. And so, you know, that core was chosen to start with. Um, yes, we had a couple other sections before that, but this was the result. Um, so then the output is uh, 220 microhenries, uh, then it becomes a volumetric size of the core from there. Um, you can use, you know, uh, different ACP, of P, case of G, uh, to size uh, the core however you want to. Um, at the end of the day, you know, these characteristics came out. Uh, and the other thing is we didn't want to make it so large. Um, this was already about a two pound inductor. Um, and so it, we had discussions about, can we make it a little larger for better performance? We could, but then it's like, we don't want the inductor to be, you know, that huge, uh, you know, in scale uh, to be able to do that. So again, compromises. Um, you can see the output from the inductor to, uh, design, um, well-behaved uh, saturation roll-off uh, as a design point is about right here in operation. Um, so we've got about a 10, 20% uh, roll-off uh, at that 80 kilohertz of operation. Um, and so something that actually tested well and, and Wolf Speed was happy with. And so from that optimized design, then we said, okay, now let's take a look to say, what are our design extrema? So we lowered the operating frequency to 20 kilohertz. Um, so there is actually an exhaustive uh, saturation point in inductance. Now that the inductor should at the end of the day be larger. Um, so in order to maintain just simple operation at 20 kilohertz, uh, an achievable inductance of about 140 microhenries was really about it for that core size. And we're already at a very large uh, amount of saturation current simply because of the limitation of inductance per frequency we were dealing with. Um, and really the goal was to still try to maintain continuous mode of operation. Um, as you can see on the right, you've got much higher ripple current, which makes sense. Um, and just, just beginning to be in discontinuous mode of operation. Um, but this can be adjusted on the kit overall. Uh, so that inductor size met the criteria, low frequency operation. All right, so let's go to high frequency operation. Uh, now you've got something that's in 300 kilohertz range at the top end. Uh, we can easily achieve the amount of uh, nominal inductance given in the original spec sheet, 220 microhenries, uh, with well-behaved current operation. Uh, now, the advantage of higher frequency operation, now the core is eased um, in aspect uh, of circulating current. And so peak-to-peak uh, -peak ripple is actually lower uh, given that. And so you have an even more well-behaved uh, continuous mode of operation, essentially lower peak-to-peak -peak operation with that same inductor that we're using. So you can see, I thought this was a good example to really show the range of the inductor um, to where if we were picking it for a kit uh, to meet a particular range of operation. But you can see that really from the previous side at low frequency operation, you would probably want to redesign the inductor uh, either with a, a different material, uh, but probably something, a physically larger size of core. Uh, and for this slide ending up with 300 kilohertz, you could probably say, okay, we can probably make the inductor a little bit smaller uh, if we wanted to reduce turns, we can increase uh, operating flux a bit. Uh, we could even toy with making this a little bit higher inductance operation to keep peak -to -peak current low. Um, again, all those optimization things can happen based on these trials. And this is really what we do um, in helping you optimize a design uh, for a given magnetic component. This happens to be for an inductor, but transformer design is, is the same. Um, it's just you've got a primary and secondary with a turns ratio um, to consider. Um, so from a performance perspective, this is kind of a, a little more in-depth evaluation uh, of the operation. 
um, I wanted to finish up by putting in, you know, EMI considerations um, for the magnetics itself is going to have, and this is, is in particular to conducted emissions. Um, I didn't have enough time to, to really talk about radiated emissions that much. Um, but really being able to uh, design the most efficient input filter um, in relation to uh, material operations for the inductor itself, the components that go into that with consideration, both of those can be a consideration for the actual material. And so this next slide is really to say, um, how does the impedance curve or the anatomy of an inductor from impedance uh, work. Um, and I know it's always something that's considered with, with engineers when they're laying out a power circuit, um, but EMI is typically later in, in development. It's like, we got to get the project done first, well, then we can go EMI. Well, this is more of uh, slides that kind of get your brain thinking about EMI while you're in that process. Um, so this is an initial curve to say, okay, we have a typical inductor, um, with an impedance reaction, which is going to be, I'm going to do some dots. So you've got the red line here with impedance reaction for a given component itself. Um, we subdivide that. So at the low end of frequency spectrum, that's main, that's mostly inductive. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's the impedive energy put in from really LI or the inductance of the inductor itself. Um, and then at kind of this middle region, You've got a combination of inductance and then DCR um, comes into play here, um, which is the actual you know DC resistance of the winding itself. And then after this peak point, let me get to my line. Peak point here, um, really at this point is is the the self resonant point of the inductor. Um, so after that, um, the parasitic capacitance starts to take over of the circuit. Um, so you've got, you know, high frequency filters. You've now, you've got roll off on the top end. Um, and so parasitic control, um, is really one of the goals then for EMI mitigation for magnetics design, uh, for an inductor, it would be distributed capacitance, uh, for a transformer, it would be a combination of distributed capacitance. And then that primary to secondary interwinding capacitance, uh, between the two, um, with CIW being to be small as well um to you know decrease that that signal path um for conducted emission um from secondary back to primary um all that gets uh taken into account uh really by you know deconstructing this anatomy curve for the inductor so then you say okay what kind of materials then should i be considering at the same time i need to optimize this power loss um for the actual design to handle the circuit um, I know we're getting a little bit complex here, but again, I wanted to mention that any material that you choose, its complex permeability um, will be a factor in its impedance reaction uh, back onto the conducted emissions output from that said component. Um, and really it centers down to um, what you want uh, from the inductor itself which is a, the, the mu prime portion of the complex permeability uh, versus its, its loss dependency or its mu double prime. Um, obviously you want you know, lowest frequency dependent loss, uh, just like you would typical you know, regular core loss due to power. Um, same thing handles with noise energy at the same time with a given material. So that big uh, fancy explanation just means that you can subdivide materials uh, that you are considering for magnetics design, really into frequency ranges. Um, I'm going to back up. So any complex permeability range, um, and again, this is this is this curve really represents single turn uh, outputs. In other words, we're not considering the windings yet. It's, this is just due to the material, the material itself. Whether you're choosing, you know, more uh, iron related. Uh, type of thing at a lower end of the spectrum, uh, ferrite for this this kind of red middle range, uh, or you know advanced alloy or nickel zinc type materials in this purple range. Each material grouping is going to have its sweet spot as to the amount of maximum impedance it can give up. Again, for single turn operation, based on its complex permeability uh, that it brings to the party uh, for EMI mitigation. Um, and so really it's really 
<laughs> choosing material at the same time for best EMI property at the same time. So I know this is like multiple things to consider, but it's again, things that we think of when we're, we're doing a given design for a customer. Um, so now that we've got materials taken care of, it's more how are we gonna wind this thing? Um, and in particular for common mode chokes in this example, um, common mode chokes can kind of be a, a, a multitasker as far as operation goes. Uh, for common mode attenuation, you've got two windings uh, in relation on a, on a single uh, winding or core body. i use my turn again. And say, how are we gonna arrange these windings? Um, well, there's two main things. We've got sectional, which is separating the windings between the two, or we can run them by filer. Primary and secondary, or the two windings are, are brought in close approximation to each other. Each one gives approximately the same amount of common mode rejection. However, the multitasker portion of a CMC is you can take advantage of the leakage inductance between the two windings in order to uh, mitigate, mitigate differential mode noise, conducted emission uh, in a given circuit. So whether you've got sectional or bifiler configurations within the magnetics themselves changes that differential mode rejection at the top end. Um, so the configuration of the windings uh, has a lot to do with it as well. And then I was gonna put one more slide in uh, besides this, that as you add turns of wire onto either a common mode choke or a regular differential mode inductor, it moves that impedance maximum from single turn operation in, in this slide, um, let's say you need, so windings will increase the amount of impedance uh, per turn that you put on a given core. However, it decreases this resonance uh, downward in frequency range uh, in relation to how many turns of wire you put on a given core. And so when you see families of curves with series releases in particular for, uh, it's, it's typically more for common mode chokes well, you'll have multiple part uh, listings, uh, and then you'll notice the frequency ranges. We can see if impedance increases and frequency decreases, there's, it's the same core. There's more turns of wire on the same thing. So you're, you're coming up with families of curves in that fashion. Um, so the design of an of a EMI component is really that way. Um, essentially, you put a lot of turns of wire, and you actually measure and take off turns uh, as you go uh, in order to optimize for um, an EMI designed for a given customer. So overall in summary, um, the, uh, the wide band gap, silicon and, and GAN technology, uh, I mean, lots of benefits for development of, of you know, a, an actual power or circuit of operation, um, really for increased, you know, power density uh, things, high frequency operation, higher efficiency, all the proper buzzwords. Um, and so, you know, calculations for the magnetics design, try, we try to take advantage of all those benefits. Um, it's just that there's, <laughs> there's limitations to that. And so uh, we do the best that we can. Um, and this is where really kind of the unique, you know, artful measure of, of coming up with, with unique designs to take advantage of really higher and higher power density per unit volume at the end of the day. It's just frequency is, is the, the, the main driver um, for the design, uh, affects itself and really in real world factors for us. Um, again, so it's selecting, you know, the right material for the right frequency, uh, minimizing the total volume of the magnetics, uh, taking into account, you know, any, uh, safety standards or considerations that we need to. Um, and then really it's the internal, you know, the windings, the gapping, um, all the things that are taking into account. Um, that establish, you know, output operation that, and I say output operation meaning EMI or minimizing a parasitic or some other aspect that you, the customer would need uh, from us as far as a design input, or sorry, a design output from your uh, parameters that you need. Um, so the result is really just coming up with, you know, the best magnetic solution um, really through analysis, optimization, test and measure. Um, you know, Borns, here at Borns, we've got, you know, we got solutions for road mapping that's trying to address these as fast as we can to keep best-in-class magnetics. Um, but at the end of the day, it's 
really the customer asking questions for us. Uh, we take those into consideration for uh, designs that we do, uh, either in single, you know, custom transformer or magnetics design, uh, or in a series release at the same time uh, that we would put on the open market. And with that, uh, that's the information that I have for you today. And it looks like I'm about on time for what they told me I was supposed to be. Um, so now we've got uh, some time for Q&A. Uh, and I believe I'm going to bring that over to Chris to manage Q&A um, at this point. And we can start answering some questions, which it looks like we have some. All right, well, thank you, Kyle, for a great presentation. We're going to now move on to the question and answer portion of our event. As a reminder, if you'd like to participate in our Q&A session, simply type your question into the text box located to the right of the presentation window, or you can click on the Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen, type your question in, and then click the Submit button. Please note that we'll try to get to as many of your questions as we possibly can here in the time that we have left. If we don't get to your question today, someone will be getting back to you after the program is over. So Kyle, let's get started with some questions here. Our first one, all things being equal, uh, will increasing the frequency of the magnetic component increase or decrease uh, core loss? Uh, oh, good question. Um, i tell you what, is, is, the, is the slideshow still up? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go back yes, to... Yes, it's available, yeah. I'm going to go back to this slide. Um, and so, again, as you increase uh, frequency here, now the, the kicker is all things being equal. Um, I think this is more if I increase the frequency, my core loss will actually increase because for a given material, yes, you will typically have more loss um, per, uh, per unit of power um, with increasing frequency. However, it's the all things being equal, which means if I take one magnetic and a component and I simply force it to operate at a higher frequency, what actually happens is you're at the same time decreasing the operating flux density of the unit. And so I would surmise that you're actually going to decrease the amount of core loss um, per unit of increasing frequency because we're not changing the size of the core at all. Um, and so that, that, uh, I would surmise that I'm, I'm, I'm going to say core loss actually, uh, or sorry, yes, core loss decreases with increasing frequency, all things being equal. All right. Thank you, Kyle. And we're going to move on to another question here for you. Our next question, how large, uh, can I make the gap in a gapped magnetic component? Ah, um, uh, really it's from the standpoint of, a, of exhaustive gapping. Um, you can make a gap as large as you want to, but at some point it's law of diminishing returns. You, you, you basically, um, you keep lowering the reluctance of, of the core path itself. In other words, it's the resistive portion of flux and it can't get across the gap anymore. Um, I usually think in terms of, uh, you know, the, the total uh, path length, if you're getting to be, you know, five times uh, if your gap size is about um, about one fifth of the total um, you know, core path of, of the core itself, it, that's kind of that law of diminishing returns point. Is you just can't get enough energy in the size of that core uh, for a given gap at that point. So I kind of use that rule of say five times. If my gap's getting larger than that, then I got fringing problems and a bunch of things. Might as well just make the core larger. All right, thank you, Kyle. And we had a question asking if they can get a copy of the slides, and, and you will receive a personalized follow-up email with details and a link to today's presentation on demand where you'll be able to do that. You can also click on the green folder icon at the bottom of your screen for more information on all of that. Uh, we'll move on to another question here. Automotive grade in OBC chargers means all components need to be uh, a quality AEQ? Um, oh, um... I should say qualify AEQ, excuse me. Yeah, so, I mean, AQ, ACQ is, is it's a grouping of, of a testing and measurement for the, the Automotive Electric Commissions to say this is what's going to give the highest reliability for a given part. So 
um, it's probably in your best interest um, to have all components <laughs> qualify for AECQ or AEQ uh, criteria, in particular for automotive applications. One, simply because everybody else does. Um, but for two, it literally gives highest reliability. Um, so do you absolutely have to? Um, I guess technically you wouldn't. Um, but I mean, ACQ also works into PPAP qualifications, uh, functional safety and safety standards. They all kind of get merged together. Um, so I would say in general, yes, you probably should um, have all your components be AC or AQ, ACQ qualified. All right. Thank you, Kyle. And why is altitude required? Ah, um, I'm going to call this opinion, but I think it's kind of factual. So altitude really at, you know, uh, 5,000, 10,000 meters, um, thinner air um, reduces what's called, and this is really in relation to, to safety and operation, uh, altitude with a given plastic that you use, and this isn't even magnetics design, uh, increasing altitude decreases the CTI or the comparative tracking index of any given material that you use. Uh, so at higher and higher altitudes, um, your CTI rating will drop. In other words, uh, electricity will want to track um, or have a more tendency to track along the surface at higher altitude. Um, and so I think that's the reason why they, they have different altitude requirements. Um, for, I mean, obviously for avionics or space flight. Um, and from our perspective, it's, yeah, it's, it's CTI rating. All right, thank you, Kyle. Uh, we'll move on to another question here. Uh, what are some major automotive customers that have adopted these products? Um, I guess I'll just say if it's, you know, our automotive customers um, for, you know, wide band gap operation, um, to be honest, I would just have to do it based on frequency. Um, I mean, with involvement of our automotive customers, I mean, we're involved with, you know, in particular the, the, the EV customers that are out there in general with the, you know, the Teslas, the GMs, the Fords, uh, we're in conversations with them. Um, I'm trying to think of like sp a specific instance that I know is using, you know, sick or GAN type of things. Um, uh, wow, I can't I can't think of a specific off the top of my head because it's I mean, and I'm not trying to avoid the question. It's just I'm trying to think of something that would be kind of what I consider to be out of the ordinary for frequency of operation uh, as opposed to, you know, what we're producing. Because, I mean, our customers won't come and say, uh, I want to use silicon carbide for this um, outright. Um, it's probably more, um, to be honest, I can't give you a good answer for automotive, but on the industrial side, we're doing a lot of comparisons, um, in transition. People are using silicon, silicon fets right now. They're trying to do price optimization for their, uh, project feasibility, whether SIC is going to work based on cost. And we do are doing analysis for that, um, you know, more so for industrial than for automotive at this point. Um, however, it's like, ah, I don't know if that's a good answer or not. Um, but I can tell you it's definitely well on its way in transition. Um, I'd say a couple of years ago, SIC wasn't, it was there, just wasn't as prevalent in use because of price. Well, now it is. All right, thank you, Kyle. We have time for just a couple more questions. We've got uh, three more here I'd like to get to, but uh, we'll have to kind of uh, see what we what we can do here. Yeah, I our, our next one, <laughs> have you planned to write a Bourne's Magnetic Design Handbook? There are many things for <laughs> to consider. <laughs> yes, I have all the time in the world to write a design handbook for magnetics. Um, to be honest, it's always on the, it's, it's conversations. And so, I mean, right now we're trying to do webinars. We've got uh, several uh, papers that we're working um, with, you know, our associations with, you know, our, our distributors and magazines and, and everyone we're working with. So in bits and pieces, yes, um, as far as an all-in-one document, 
Uh, not yet. All right. Thank you, Kyle. And we've got two more questions here I'd like to try and sneak in. Is there a difference between the AECQ certified and the AECQ compliant? Ah, the difference between certified and compliant. Um, it's kind of funny. I uh, Can you actually get AECQ cert? Yeah, I think you can get certification on an individual component. Say, like, just a magnetic component. If it says it's AECQ certified, it means they have gone through the approval process uh, from, you know, a given agency and gotten, you know, the, 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 the proper paperwork for approval. Compliance means it has been tested for all the operations of AECQ and it would comply for full approval uh if you wanted to it's just there's a cost involved in fully appro fully approving something um and so when we say we've tested for all compliancy yes it meets all the criteria but no we don't have the the diploma of approval um to have gone through the whole process all right thank you kyle looks like we have time for just one last question for you here uh, is there a difference between using silicon, uh, silicon, silicon carbide, and gallium nitride for the EV industry versus the standard automotive industry? And is one better suited for the EV industry uh, overall? Um, <sighs> I'm going to say yes and no. Um, the first thing is the it, when you receive the, a copy of the slide presentation, look at, I think it was slide eight. It's the mode of operation really for S SI and SIC as far as operating voltage and frequency. GAN is, is oh, perfect. Um, it, it boils down to um, voltage and frequency of operation. So that's the very first thing. So like you really can't interchange, uh, say you've got a 1200 volt operating uh, voltage, GAN just won't do it yet. Um, just because it, it can't handle that amount of input voltage today. Um, so that's the first difference between, so group SI, SIC, and I usually say MOSFET and GAN, okay? As long as you're in those two different buckets, um, it's their application in the EV industry uh, and automotive. Um, automotive will, will tend to have more uh, testing and measurement criteria uh, in particular for a while of reliability and operation as maybe opposed to the EV industry. Um, so as far as suiting it for that, um, well, flat out, we're seeing more uh, SI to SIC conversion in the um, probably EV industry right now versus standard automotive just because there's more electronic circuitry, uh, you know, sensors and whatnot that need to be addressed for EV. Um, yeah, and in particular, SI and SIC power circuits, GAN, we're seeing more, you know, low power and, and signal type applications. We need very high switching frequencies at lower voltage. That'll be the, the last follow-up. All right, well, thank you, Kyle. That does look like all the time that we have for questions for today. I know that there were some questions that were left unanswered. We will be getting back to you after the program is over. I'd like to thank Kyle for a great presentation and Q&A session. And for more information related to today's webinar, please visit any of the resource links available in the green folder icon at the bottom of your screen. Within the next 24 hours, you will receive a personalized follow-up email with details and a link to today's presentation on demand. Once again, we'd like to thank you for attending today's webinar, Magnetic Component Design Considerations for SMPS Applications using silicon carbide and gallium nitride technology. Brought to you by Tech Online, Borns, and Arrow. This webinar is copyright 2022 by Aspen Core. The presentation materials are owned by or copyright by Tech Online, Borns, and Arrow. And the individual speaker is solely responsible for his content and opinions. On behalf of our guest, Borns and Arrow, I'm Chris Keach. Once again, we'd like to thank you for joining us and we hope you have a great day.